Shimon Radley from Ben Gurion University. Uh, I'm speaking now both as a survivor and as a historian. Uh, as to photography, I would like to remark on my own uh, my own experience when I started looking back and uh, collecting and looking through photographs, there is one big gap, and I think this should be taken into account. My last photo, photo of myself is from 1939, and then until 1946, seven, there is nothing. In other words, during the time of the war and the Holocaust, there is no photographic memory in our family. That's one remark. Another remark to your excellent and very interesting uh, uh, presentation, uh, talking about uh, artifacts and objects. I remember that while we were hiding, a few members of our family, they kept talking about uh, objects which were left with uh, our Gentile friends or neighbors and then used by selling them and, and buying food or other things or paying the people who were in whose houses we were hiding. So this is also a certain aspect of of objects. I remember them talking about very nice nightgowns, by the way. Nightgowns with embroidery and so on, and, and, and I kept these memories for maybe 70 years. They were talking again and again about these nice things that they used to survive. Yeah, thank you. I answered to that last fascinating question. I found, uh, I haven't focused on gender issues specifically in my research on testimony, on um, artifacts found in testimony, but anecdotally I have discovered that uh, far more women that I've interviewed and read, whose testimony I've read, talk specifically about special artifacts that meant something to them. Uh, either that they continue to own, or that they're uh, that they've given to museums, sometimes unwillingly, but of necessity, or that they remember very distinctly. And I was so interested in what you said about the nightgowns and the embroidery. Uh, that seems to me I have not discovered that among men uh, survivors whom I've interviewed or whose testimony I've read, but it's very prevalent among the women. Uh, your question was about the gender <coughs> differences. Well, there is a gender aspect which I didn't really reflect on for the photographs. Um, but of course, there were the women, uh, the photo of the women SSK guards, and the, the comment is almost uh, misogynistic as well, because he, yes, it does put the emphasis on. Um, uh, how the discrepancy of the weight of the portraits uh, as compared to the uh, the skeletons that they were buried. Um, so for Fies, it's almost like um, also an insult to say that they are very plump women uh, in his accus accusation of uh, of what the the Nazis did to them. So. I think there's this aspect, but otherwise I, I don't have a big enough pool to really make a gendered analysis of the, of the photographs of the testimonies, because as I said, the, the majority of them don't use photos in the post-war years, so it's only a, a few cases. So. Um, there mentioned briefly the, the, the way how the perpetrators presented themselves and that it's a very manly, soldier-like um, image to create and the, the, um, the, the conceptual, conceptualization of DSS is a very masculine organization as a part of my analysis as well. And on the other hand, I use gender categories also in the way how I analyze what is being depicted, so to say. 
especially a female person is at the Ravensburg concentration camp, if there is a difference to um, concentration camps from, from men. Um, in general, there were, of course, more concentration camps um, only for men, uh, sometimes with sub camps um, for women. But Ramos' book is a very outstanding example, so I integrate this is, uh, in my study as well. Concerning the, the four photos from the Sonderkommando in uh, Auschwitz-Birkenau, I'm, I'm integrating them in, the, in my study also, uh, as well as photos from, that were taken by prisoners at Ramsbrück. But it's a very, very rare case, so there will also be a, a special chapter in the, in the, whole, um, in the whole thesis. Um, but they kind of highlight also the importance of, uh, like the lack of, of, of visual sources by victims and also that although it was extremely uh, risky and, um, um, and dangerous for prisoners, there were, there were a few cases where people tried to photograph in the camps and some were caught um, while doing so actually, so they are very prominently integrated. I personally met a survivor from, from the Sonderkommando in Birkenau and he told me how he thought that these pictures were taken and that was a very inspirational meeting because he kind of contextualized them for me. Unfortunately, I didn't record it, but I will also refer to that. Okay. After these very interesting discussion of photographs, I thought uh, you might want to hear a funny story about photographs. After the war, Japan, unlike Germany, was not divided into occupation zones, and Tokyo, unlike Vienna and Berlin, was not divided into zone, into sectors. But because there was a very substantial part of the main island of Honshu, where there was a British occupation force, the leaders early on decided that the Brits had to have some symbolic representation in Tokyo. In Tokyo, there is the area where the imperial palace is, with park area and a couple of buildings. And in the brick walls that surround it are about four or five entrances with guard houses. And the decision made by some genius at the top was that the British representation in Tokyo would be to provide the guards at one of these entrances. No Japanese or American had the slightest interest in breaking into the imperial grounds. You will have no trouble understanding that. The job, therefore, of the British guards in their proper special guard uniforms was to look good for the American soldiers who were constantly there to take their pictures. <laughs> there must be literally thousands of these pictures because GIs, this, I'm talking about 1946-47, tended to have cameras. And by the time we're ta I'm talking about, the number of American soldiers who had seen breast, dressed up British soldiers just went, was zero. <clears throat> so they all stood there. And as I said, the main task of these British soldiers was to look good for the American soldiers who were taking their pictures day in and day out. Great, great. Yeah.